Focus on Headline. And let's take a look at what major issues are making the headlines today on Focus on Headline. For this, joining us in the studio, we have our reporters Yu Zemin and Che Jehi. Guys, welcome back to the studio. Good evening, Good evening. Mr. All right, so we're going to start things off with some domestic politics news here. President Moon Jae-in calling for a meeting with President-elect Yoon suk yeol without conditions. Uh, of course, uh, there was supposed to be a meeting earlier, that being canceled, but uh, no apparent progress in holding that meeting for now. So let's get the updates on this, Sumin. Sure. So President Moon Jae-in urged President-elect Yoon suk yeol to make a decision on their meeting himself rather than listening to the views of his close aides. Well, according to Senior Presidential Secretary for Public Communication Park su hyun earlier today, Moon was quoted as saying that preconditions and negotiations are not necessary between the departing incumbent and the incoming successor as this essentially is a president-elect paying a courtesy call to the incumbent president. While a planned luncheon meeting between the president and his successor was called off just hours before it was scheduled to begin last Wednesday. And on top of that, the working-level discussions on Monday also ended without tangible results. So at this point, a meeting is not taking place soon. Yeah, it does seem like uh, there is, uh, they are at odds at certain issues here and there. Uh, maybe that's uh, one of the reasons for why uh, this meeting meeting is not being taken place. But the finance ministry began a performance reporting session with the transition committee earlier today. Uh, main agenda includes ways to secure funding for the extra budget. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so efforts to hand over the remaining tasks of this administration are currently in the works. While well, the finance ministry is expected to report the available budget to the presidential transition committee earlier today. Well, as President-elect Yoon suk yeol has made it clear, he plans to draw up a supplementary budget worth 50 trillion won to compensate small business owners. So this report is expected to focus on securing funds for the supplementary budget provision, for example, the fund surplus or reserve funds by access tax revenue. Well, to secure additional funding, the government is now considering restructuring this year's budget rather than creating new debts. So that means the budget allocated for the now incumbent President Moon's signature Korean New Deal project could drastically be reduced in the next government. Well, however, if the financial sources cannot be entirely covered only by restructuring uh, the budget, the issuance of some deficit-covering bonds could be an inevitable option. Well, in that case, and as interest rates on government bonds rise, the market could become unstable. And there's also a concern that the increase in national debt will adversely affect the national credit rating in the future. So the ministry will review measures to secure fiscal resources in ways that will minimize the issuance of government bonds. And actually, uh, Yoon's transition committee also reaffirmed earlier today that the government bond issuance will be their last resort. So the specific agendas could include ways to ease property taxes, mainly on owners of a single household. In line with the ministry's briefing yesterday, they said they will adopt state assessed price value for homes from last year, not this year, because it sharply increased this year as well. Well, President-elect Yoon suk yeol promised to ease the comprehensive real estate tax for single homeowners and also to overhaul other property-related taxes. So these will all be reflected in future task reviews sessions. Again, uh, not only are we not seeing a meeting between the incumbent president and the soon-to-be president, but uh, there has been some rift over different issues uh, with uh, you know, President-elect Yoon suk yeol and uh, key figures from the current administration as well. We talked about, of course, the BOK governor issue. Uh, apparently a lack of discussion on that, but this time Yoon's transition team refusing to hear a policy briefing from the Justice Ministry this time. Tell us what this is about, Chihi. Sure. So a policy briefing from the Justice Ministry was scheduled to take place earlier today, but President-elect Yoon suk yeols transition team's subcommittee for political, judicial, and administrative affairs said it informed the ministry hours before the briefing the session had been postponed. So the subcommittee's refusal of the briefing came after Justice Minister Park Bom-gye expressed objection towards Yoon's campaign promises regarding judicial reform at a press briefing with reporters held just yesterday. Now, Park said he opposes Yoon's plans to abolish the justice minister's authority to direct investigations, uh, empower the prosecution to draw up its budget, and expand the scope of investigations led by the prosecution. 
Now, in response to Park's public opposition to Yoon's pledges, Lee Yong-ho, who is the People Power Party representative, uh, the subcommittee's chief as well, said during a press briefing that he thinks it's rude and incomprehensible that a minister who will step down some 40 days from now uh, with the change of government directly oppose the campaign pledges of the president-elect just a day before his ministry's policy briefing. Now, he added the executive branch members must fulfill the president-elect's pledges and Yoon's promises aim to restore the people's trust in the prosecution and strengthen its independence and political neutrality. Now, meanwhile, Yu Sangbum of the People Power Party told reporters the decision to postpone the briefing was made entirely by this subcommittee, not by Yoon, and added that the subcommittee plans to reschedule the session for early next week. Now, Yoon also made remarks regarding Justice Minister Park's opposition. Uh, he said he believes giving individual authority to the prosecution contributes even more to independence and that it's not easy to expect neutrality without acknowledging sovereignty of the prosecution. Now, he also said the prosecution reform by the current government that was carried out for the past five years uh, was aimed at protecting the neutrality of the prosecution. But Park's remarks and his opposition to uh, Yoon's pledges sounds like that five years of effort was a total failure. Again, I mean, the consensus, especially because of uh, Yoon sung uh, background as the prosecutor general, I mean, again, uh, you know, the two parties are basically clashing over, you know, how much power the prosecution has or how much power the justice minister has. And uh, this is going to be one of those uh, big I guess, clashes that we're going to see with the two parties leading up to, of course, the inauguration of Yoon Uh Nevertheless, uh, former President Park Geun-hye being released from uh, the hospital earlier today. Now, this was followed by the return of the former president's hometown of Daegu. She was welcomed by her supporters, uh, made some remarks as well. Uh, Sumi, tell us more about this. Yeah, so earlier today, former President Park Geun-hye arrived at her hometown of Taesong County, Daegu, about 300 kilometers southeast of Seoul. Well, upon arrival, she expressed deep affection for the southern city, which voted her into parliament four times before hold presidential victory thanks to the locals for their warm, warm welcome. She said that she will contribute whatever little strength I have to the country's development to help talented people who's now in charge of realizing her unfulfilled dreams. Well, hours before arriving at her hometown, former President Park Geun-hye was discharged from the hospital earlier today, saying that her health has recovered a lot thanks to the concerns from people. Well, Park was pardoned in December after spending four years and nine months in prison on a 22-year sentence for corruption. And after a four-month hospitalization to treat her chronic illness, she left the Samsung Medical Center in Seoul. And also, she visited the grave of her late father and former President Park Jung-hee at National, Seoul National Cemetery before heading to her new residence in Daegu. Well, despite some wide media speculations of her making some political comments upon her release from the hospital, she did not convey any explicit political message. So her words were closely watched by a, for a potential political message, including any mention of President-elect Yoon song yeol because as we are well aware, Yoon, as a former prosecutor, she, he investigated the corruption allegations against Park, that which led to her impeachment, removal from office, and imprisonment in 2017. But this time, there weren't a specific mention or reference to the incoming president. Well, in the meantime, President-elect Yoon song yeol announced his plans to visit former President Park Geun-hye at a new residence in Daegu when he begins touring provinces from next week. And he also said he plans to invite Park Geun-hye to his inauguration ceremony on May 10th, citing the custom of inviting all ex-presidents. It is very interesting once again, <laughs> and I think a lot of people were kind of wondering whether or not former President Park Geun-hye upon her release uh, was going to make any kind of statement mm-hmm. uh, leading up to the presidential election, right? Uh, is she going to show support uh, mm. for someone that was responsible for her being behind bars or she's going to show support for someone that's pretty much, I guess, the party that came into power because of her uh, impeachment. And so she was kind of uh, you know, stuck in a uh, limbo there. And obviously she made absolutely no remarks, which I basically was uh, probably the smartest thing to do at this time. But let's talk about uh, 
former President Park Geun-hye's potential impact on the next administration. And not to mention, we also have the uh, upcoming local elections uh, over in June. Let's uh, start off with you, ji well, I think uh, Park Geun-hye is still a pretty influential figure oh, in the political, <laughs> yes, yeah. uh, political field. And if she uh, attends the uh, inauguration ceremony, and if she starts making moves in the political field again, I think it's going to make the conservatives more binding. Yeah. Uh, and she also has her close, close aides mm. who used to work for her, right? And some of them have been... Uh, appointed some important uh, positions by Yun in his transition committee. And I think they should also do their part well uh, to be influential as well and make sure that this new administration receives positive uh, positive comments from uh, in the political field now but then I I want uh, I I want to make sure that Yoon has like the analytic eyes uh, to make rational decisions by himself not just listen to his aides or uh, just be swayed by um, the people around him to make not make mistakes <laughs> regarding that again uh, but I believe because because he was a he he's a prosecutor, I'm sure he has the sharp, keen eyes to make decisions by himself and uh, know what's right and wrong, uh, and just won't be swayed by the thoughts of people around him. But I think uh, other than Park Geun-hye herself, what's more important for the next local in, uh, elections as well is not just her figure, like that influential figure herself, but a harmony with the opposition party, the, mm-hmm. the Democratic Party, which is to become the opposition party, mm-hmm. uh, the People Powers Party, when the new uh, administration takes office. I think a harmony t- is to be uh, shown so that people can gain trust towards this new administration. I mean, we're seeing a lot of rift and disagreements regarding many different issues at the moment, even before the new administration takes office. So I think Yoon has to uh, show a more harmonizing kind of attitude. He needs to be willing to listen to the other party as well when making decisions so that uh, the the People Power Party can gain more power during the local elections. I mean, you know, President like Yoon Se Gary did pledge that uh, he wants to bring about uh, bipartisan unity, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but I mean, just judging by some of the things that we're seeing, uh, maybe he wants unity, but it does also seem like people around him are just <laughs> not willing to uh, <laughs> compromise. But and you know what? Rightfully so, in some ways, because I mean, let's face it. I mean, this rift that we're seeing right now, it's mm-hmm. not something that happened over a few months. It's been happy for years right now. In fact, the past five years, Mm -hmm. uh, this is what was going on. Uh, But nevertheless, uh, before I jump in, uh, assuming let's get your take on this. Uh, Do you think Park has impact or potentially have impact on the next administration and, of course, the local uh, elections in June? Yeah, apparently, yes. And as we know, Daegu and Gyeongsangbuk, the regions, are traditionally conservative strongholds. And we do know, as as Chihi said, that former President Park Geun-hye has such a strong supporter base in the region. And, I mean, looking at her remarks earlier today, she did display her particular attachment, her fondness to the region by referring to her past. So, to me, it was not explicitly political, but it did convey enough messages and her position toward that region. And I don't think it's necessarily has to do with uh, President-elect Yoon song yeol but I think it's to solidify her base in the region. And that could help, intentionally or not, the PPP, People Power Party, in the upcoming local election. And we do know that Yoon song yeol already expressed willingness to invite Park to the inauguration ceremony, also announced his plans to visit Park himself. And this also might be his ways to win the TK region voters' hearts because usually it's safe for the Conservative Party to garner votes in the Gyeongsangdo region, but it's not, it's by no means uh, a safe situation in the, this year's local election because remember, Busan, Ulsan, and South Gyeongsangdo province, which had the overwhelming lead in the public opinion polls during the presidential election, PPP was not able to exceed 60% mm. of the votes in that region. So these regions are not taken for granted for the PPP by, uh, at this point. So I think Yoon wants Park, Park, former President Park Geun-hye's help uh, as the PPP is expected to focus on nominating the Seoul mayor, Gyeonggi-do governor, or the head of the Chungcheong-do region in this local election. Interesting that you think uh, her moving to Daegu is actually a, a political move uh, because it could potentially be, to be honest with you. Uh, but just kind of going back into kind of Yoon Seo-gyar trying to 
you made a very good point with the presidential election that Gyeongsangdo region, right, Ulsan, uh, you know, Busan and the Gyeongsangnam-do region, I, they didn't get as many votes, uh, or I should say, Yoon suk yeol didn't get as many mm. votes as you know the traditional conservative uh, candidates would normally get, yeah. uh, and a lot has to do with the fact that a lot of the traditional conservatives don't really view uh, Yoon suk yeol as an actual conservative, right? Uh, mm-hmm. You look at some of his background; it was technically, you know, you know, President Moon Jae-in who placed him. In, at the seat of, uh, you know, prosecutor general seat and so forth, which is very ironic. Um, there's the whole idea that, you know, he put uh, Park Geun-hye behind bars. And, uh, you know, we're seeing him inviting her to the inauguration. He's mm-hmm. trying to get her on her side uh, to also garner more support from the uh, the conservatives. But also, Lee Myung-bak is the other kicker right now. Yeah, because exactly. Because what's Yoon suk yeol side uh, requesting for uh, President Moon to do to pardon Lee Myung-bak? Mm-hmm. And because, again, Lee Myung-bak, pres- former President Lee Myung-bak is another person that Yoon suk yeol was responsible for putting behind bars. And so it doesn't look good on his part mm-hmm. if he tries to pardon uh, Lee Myung-bak, someone that he put behind bars. Obviously, uh, Park Geun-hye was already pardoned by the Moon administration, mm-hmm. uh, President Moon, so it doesn't matter. But yeah, it does seem right now uh, Yoon suk yeol is trying to garner that uh, conservative uh, voters out there and really solidify himself as a true conservative by going through this. But uh, again, it is going to be interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, uh, I, I don't know what uh, stances uh, former presidents Park and E have on Yoon suk yeol but maybe we'll find out later on. Guys, uh, let's go into a more serious note here. I mean, we've been talking about a wave and barrage of missile launches by North Korea. Uh, this might actually be the most serious one out of all, and we did kind of predict this to come. North Korea firing what is thought to be a long-range intercontinental ballistic missile off the sea of East Coast today. We have been watching very closely. Uh, we have been seeing and uh, hearing about these uh, firings of new ICBM systems uh, being carried out twice. Uh, we also had the the uh, the, the rocket launcher, uh, you know, firings uh, on Sunday as well. But nevertheless, this is very concerning. Shihi, let's get the details of this. Sure. So the South Korean Joint Chiefs of Staff said that it detected the launch of an unidentified projectile from North Korea, which is assumed to be an intercontinental ballistic missile. Now, the projectile was fired at around 2.40 p.m. this afternoon, and South Korea's Ministry of Defense did not immediately confirm whether the test involved an ICBM, uh, which has not been test-fired at the full range since 2017. Now, the military is still analyzing details of the launch, but so far the distance has been interpreted to be around 1,080 kilometers and an apogee of 6,200 kilometers. So both South Korea and the U.S. have recently warned that North Korea appears to be preparing to test fire an ICBM at the full range uh, for the first time since 2017. Now, if you remember, the last ICBM, uh, which was Hwasong-15, and the third test of such was carried out in November 2017, and it was deemed powerful enough to reach the continental U.S. Now, if confirmed, the launch would be North Korea's 12th show of force this year, including the most recent one, as you mentioned, SJ, uh, just four days ago on March 20th, which was the four shots using multiple rocket launchers yeah, yeah. Uh, towards the West Sea. And then there was also uh, on, uh, one on March 16th when North Korea launched a suspected missile that appeared mm-hmm. to have exploded shortly after liftoff in the skies of Pyongyang. Now, analysts have suggested that the failed launch on this day was Pyongyang's so-called monster missile, or the Hwasong-17, which is known to be the largest ICBM and a new system that had never been launched before. Now, the U.S. Defense Department said earlier this month Pyongyang's other most recent launches on February 26th and March 4th were likely intended to test a new ICBM system. Now, the North is displaying a breakneck pace in testing activity, which underscores its goals of advancing weaponry and applying pressure on Washington over a deepening freeze in nuclear negotiations. Now, if today's launch turns out to be an ICBM, uh, this would mark the end of Pyongyang's self-imposed moratorium on testing long-range and nuclear weapons, and, of course, a crossing of the red line. 
Now, after this uh, afternoon's event, South Korean President Moon Jae-in presided over an emergency National Security Council meeting and strongly condemned the North's recent action, saying it was a self-destruction of its moratorium, which was a promise to the international community. And Moon also emphasized that today's launch not only caused a severe threat to the Korean peninsula, but also to the international community. And it was a clear violation of the UN Security Council resolution. Now, the president ordered to closely cooperate with all related parties, as well as President-elect Yoon, uh, to develop response measures that will ensure national security during this government's transition period. Ji, quick question. I mean, do you consider this latest launch, if indeed it mm-hmm. is proven to be a long-range ballistic missile, mm-hmm. uh, is this crossing the red line just yet? Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, so, I've said this before, too. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sumi, what about yourself? You also believe that this is crossing the red line? Yeah, I do think so. It is interesting because, again, I mean, there's different definitions. I, you're right. The consensus mm-hmm. is that the long-range intercontinental ballistic missiles are considered crossing the red line. Others are a little bit more loose with that, saying that it has to be a nuclear weapons test, which I think, I mean, that's absolutely no question that's crossing the red line there. Mm-hmm. But would you guys be surprised uh, if, especially after the inauguration of uh, Yoon suk yeols administration, that North Korea could potentially... Because if you look at... All the timeline of all the missile tests so far, it's gotten now to the long-range ballistic missile. Mm-hmm. It's not going to end there, right? And so a lot of peer, people are fearing that maybe the next step would be a nuclear, nuclear weapons, weapons test. Do you see this as a, a possibility that it will happen sometime this year? Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's a possibility. I mean, uh, North Korea is building up to yeah. uh, reach that point, and all the testings that it has carried out so far, they were all tests regarding uh, its new ICBM test, uh, ICBM system, and uh, as analysts say, their technology regarding all these weaponry is developing, getting better, enhancing really quickly, you know. So it is a possibility that we should watch out for. And in response to that, we also need to closely look at how the UN administration, once it takes office, uh, responds to all these provocations by the North. Yeah, I mean, again, uh, you know, Yoon, a lot more uh, of a hardliner when it comes to North mm-hmm. Korea. And so, you know, the consensus is that there's going to be quite a bit of tension. And Sumin, you also think that maybe a nuclear weapons test is uh, in the horizon. Yeah, yeah, on the horizon. And if the incoming Yoon administration does not do something that's favorable to the North Korean regime, I think they will resort to nuclear te- nuclear weapons testing ultimately. I think yeah, I, yeah, if it turns out to be an ICBM this time, I think the unit, incoming Yoon administration, together with the now incumbent Moon administration, they have to send a clear message. They have to do something in order to kind of ease and mitigate North Korea's future actions and activities. Yeah, I just can't. To be honest with you, you know, if indeed it is a long-range ballistic missile, it's a little bit of a surprise for me mm-hmm. because I thought it was going to come maybe after the inauguration of the uh, the UN administration, yeah. but it's moving so fast mm-hmm. and now I'm concerned about what could be next, right? And then the only thing after a, a long-range intercontinental ballistic missile is, I mean, nuclear weapons test, right? Mm-hmm. And then in that case, I mean, you were saying that maybe unless Yoon comes up with something that could appease the North, yeah. uh, you know, there's going to be quite a lot of tensions. But I mean, it's highly unlikely that I think Yoon suk is going, listen, I know. let's sit Where down. Let's sit down. <laughs> you know, we'll remove sanctions. No, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, it is very concerning with this latest test. What is also concerning uh, is, of course, the current COVID-19 situation. My goodness, I can't believe I'm seeing this on the news. South Korea having the large number of daily COVID-19 cases in, in the, the world. world, which, by the way, guys, I, I think it's only the case because we're just testing a lot. Yeah, like I feel like all true. the other co- countries Partly are true. not really testing, mm-hmm. so th- their figures are not true. But nevertheless, uh, it does seem that the, the peak that we're looking for, it's going to be delayed a bit uh, compared to what the government had earlier forecasted, especially because of now the introduction of the stealth uh, Omicron variant. But the biggest concern out of all the numbers that came in today, because it did go under 400,000, it's the uh, death toll that's also rising quite a bit, a record figure here. Uh, Assuming let's get the latest figures. Yeah, so South Korea reported nearly 400,000 new cases and record high deaths today as the Omicron variant is affecting nearly 20% of the South Korean population. Well, looking at specific figures, we reported 395,508 
98 new infections as of midnight, which raised the total caseload to 10 million 822,836. Well, this is a noticeable drop by around 100,000 from yesterday's figure, which was the second highest daily caseload. But the more concerning data that we have is the death toll. It hit a new record high of 470, which raised the total death toll to 13,902. Well, the number of critically ill patients also stood at 1,081, which is only down from down three from yesterday. Well, we do know that South Korea has been grappling with by far the worst wave of the pandemic, with nearly 9 million cases being tallied since early February. And considering that the recent death toll in the range of 300 to 400 a day reflects the situation roughly two weeks ago when the number of confirmed cases was around 200,000 per day, when the daily figures of up to nearly 400,000 that we are seeing right now, experts are forecasting that the death toll could reach up to 900. Yeah, so health authorities warned that the stealth Omicron could continue to fuel a surge in infections, and it remains uncertain to provide exact projections of when this Omicron wave will begin to taper off. And it's just like uh, senior health officials Hun Young-na had said, this situation will be a major topic of discussions over the next one or two weeks. You know, it's everything that the health experts have predicted is mm. coming true right now, because I remember when we were seeing a uh, death toll and the figures ranging around 200 or so, they were saying this is not the peak of the death toll. It mm. might go, you know, two, three times more than that. And it actually might uh, at this time. And uh, this is the biggest uh, concern out of all. Uh, but also starting today, uh, vaccine reservations for children aged 5 to 11 can be made. Uh, country had approved Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine for this age group uh, about a month ago, expanding the immunization program in the face of, of course, the ongoing uh, Omicron outbreak. Uh, there apparently are some differences uh, regarding vaccines for children and for those of the adult Maybe the dosage, who knows? Let's see, let's find out. Jihee, can you tell us more about this? Sure. So starting today, parents or guardians of children aged 5 to 11 can book vaccinations for their children, which will begin a week from now. And the reservations can be made at uh, the KDCA's website, ncvr.kdca.go.kr. And the vaccinations will begin from the 31st this month at some 1,200 designated hospitals. Now, those aged 5 to 11 refer to children born in 2010 and those whose birthdays have not yet passed. And until those born in 2017 uh, whose birthdays have passed. And the total number of these children amount to some 3.07 million. Uh, until now, the vaccine was only available for those aged 12 or older, and children aged 5 to 11 will be receiving uh, Pfizer's pediatric vaccine, which contains only a third of mm. the valley component in the current vaccine used for those 12 and above. So that's just 10 microgram. Uh, there's 30 microgram of these content for the, uh, the vaccine that we use. And so the South Korean Ministry of Food and Drug Safety approved this use of Pfizer's pediatric vaccine on the 23rd of last month and said the ministry analyzed the clinical test data submitted by Pfizer and verified the safety and effectiveness of the vaccine. Now, two shots will be inoculated, just like adults, and the period between the first and second shots is eight weeks or 56 days. Uh, however, if the second shot has to be taken earlier due to medical or any personal reasons, it can be given at any time at least three weeks after the first shot. And any side effects or problems in daily life and health conditions will be closely examined on some thousand children whose parents have agreed to be part of this active monitoring. Uh, and if the parents have not been able to reserve in advance, they have to call designated hospitals to check if there are, are any remaining vaccines. So unlike adults uh, who can book through social media for the remaining vaccines, uh, for the children aged 5 to 11, they have to actually call the hospitals to check. And the quarantine authorities are highly recommending these children, especially at high risk of showing severe symptoms once they get infected, to get vaccinated. So those with weak immunity, diabetes, obesity, chronic lung, heart or liver illnesses fall in that uh, high risk group. And other than them, the authorities recommended voluntarily deciding on the vaccination after closely examining the effects and safety of the vaccine. And also those infected after 
are receiving their first shots are not recommended to receive their second shots. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, my, my mm. uh, son doesn't fall into this category yeah. with mm. the age, but uh, because he has been infected, it, it, you know, mm. I guess he doesn't have to get the vaccine until maybe another variant pops up. Uh, let's move on to our focus on the situation in Ukraine. Uh, it's been exactly a month, mm-hmm. uh, believe it or not, since uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. Uh, the invasion is reportedly waging a Uh, Russia's largest and most complex combined military campaign since uh, taking Berlin, wow, in 1945. Uh, There were multiple reports of Russian troops being killed, their bodies uh, found as weather got warmer. Let's get an overview of this uh, really grim situation over in Ukraine, Sumin. Sure. Well, the Associated Press reported that the NATO's estimates of the casualties of Russian soldiers amounts to 7,000 to 15,000. They said the Russian soldiers have been killed in four weeks of war in Ukraine. Well, putting this into perspective, Russia lost about 15,000 troops over 10 years in Afghanistan. And considering that Russia began its invasion with roughly 190,000 troops, of course, uh, bringing in additional troops from Syria and other locations, it apparently is taking a massive toll on the country's military might. Well, NATO says that up to 40,000 Russian troops have been killed, wounded, taken prisoner, or are missing in Ukraine. Now, this is the first time that the NATO has publicly released an estimate of Russian casualties since Russia invaded Ukraine on February 24th. Well, a senior NATO military official said on the condition of anonymity that the alliance's estimate was based on information from Ukrainian authorities what Russia has released, intentionally or not, or intelligence gathered from open resources. Well, another media outlet, CNN, also reported that as the frost melts and ground thaws, uh, the bodies of Russian soldiers are seen piling up in Ukraine while the Kremlin rejected to reveal the true toll of the war. Well, in a nightly video address on Saturday, Vitaly Kim, who is the region's governor, called on local residents to help collect the course and put them in back as temperatures rise to above freezing. And also in the pictures he sent to the media outlet, there were hundreds of abandoned cores all over the region. Well, exactly how many Russian troops have been killed in Ukraine still remains a mystery. The official line from Russia's defense ministry was uh, for around 498 military personnel until Monday. But some other media outlets are saying that the toll amounts to near 10,000. So it's Realistically unable to verify all these estimates, but thousands of Russian troops have been killed in Ukraine over a course of a month, and Russia is now reportedly struggling to resupply those forces as it faces this sagging troop morale and fierce Ukrainian resistance. You know, you know, there's a lot of people uh, who say they have they have sympathy for even the Russian troops because they're saying that it wasn't their decision to go in. Mm-hmm. Um, although, you know, there were some reports of some war crimes being committed by Russian soldiers. Yeah. Uh, of course, that's been reported. But again, I mean, who is to blame for all of this? Mm. You know, the, the death of the Russian troops. It's Vladimir Putin, right? I mean, he's the one that's ordered all this. But that's one thing. But Ukraine, they also saw high troop and civilian casualties as well. So let's get the figures on that, Sumin. in. Yeah, so Ukraine has released little information about its own military losses. So President Volodymyr Zelensky said nearly two weeks ago that about 1,300 Ukrainian servicemen had been killed. Well, according to the UN Human Rights Office on uh, March 23rd local time, 977 civilians, including 81 children, died in Ukraine and also with the prolonged war, the number of refugees fleeing Ukraine has easily exceeded 3.6 million in about a month. Yeah, a lot of people might be saying, how can uh, more Russian troops die than Ukrainian uh, Mm. troops? But the fact is, in any kind of war situation, when you're invading, that's when an invasion is very dangerous. Uh, You know, when you're on the defense, you know they're coming and you are able to attack and you know the area better than, of course, those that are coming in. Uh, and which is why you're going to see obviously more casualty from the Russian side. But mm-hmm. all, all numbers aside, I mean, these are just numbers we shouldn't have seen in the first place. Uh, is I think the consensus at this time. Mm-hmm. Russia earlier adding, if you guys remember, South Korea the list of the the quote unquote unfriendly nations. Uh, in fact, if you are amongst the unfriendly nations, uh, Vladimir Putin is actually demanding these countries to pay for Russian natural gas 
in rubles. Uh, Chihi, let's round things out with this. Sure. So on Wednesday, Vladimir Putin said that gas sales to countries deemed unfriendly to Moscow would have to be paid in rubles, noting a freeze on Russia's assets by foreign nations had destroyed Moscow's trust. Now, as of January 27th, some 58 percent of Russian gas giant Gazprom's natural gas sales to Europe and other countries were settled in euros. And in the third quarter of last year, 39 percent were in U.S. dollars. Uh, And Putin said yesterday at a televised meeting that Russia will continue, of course, to supply natural gas in accordance with volumes and prices uh, fixed in previously concluded contracts. But the changes will only affect the currency of payment, which will be changed to the Russian rubles. Now, the new requirement appeared to be aimed at propping up the flagging Russian currency by increasing demand for it. And after the announcement, uh, the ruble, in fact, strengthened against the U.S dollar and the euro. Uh, Natural gas prices surged in Europe, where Russia has supplied about 45 percent of the imports. And one expert said the move amounted to a quote-unquote symbolic counter sanction aimed at the West, which has imposed sweeping sanctions on Russia. And the Kremlin had already ordered exporters to exchange 80 percent of their foreign currency proceeds for rubles. Uh, Meanwhile, U.S. President Joe Biden and European allies are expected to announce some new sanctions on Russia this week. That's right. And uh, believe it or not, after Vladimir Putin uh, made this announcement with the payment of rubles, uh, stock markets there started skyrocketing. Mm -hmm. The value of rubles started going up as well, which puts really an important, really really shows you how many people uh, rely on Russian Mm -hmm. natural gas and oil, right? Nevertheless, guys, as always, thank you very much for your report and your insights on some of these issues. Please stay safe and we'll see you guys again. Take care. You can listen to Korea Now with me, SJ Lee, by downloading the Arirang Radio application or tune in online by visiting www.arirangradio.com. So make sure you tune in Mondays through Fridays, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Korea time.